Um, so this week we're talking about uh, relationships. So typically relationships within families, but also uh, romantic relationships as well. So by relationships, we're, last week we talked about interacting with others. Uh, but here this is more, more than just interactions. This is actually about kind of um, attachment and kind of affection and uh, intimacy as well. So rather than just uh, seeing lots of people, it's about a kind of more, so, a more emotional bond that you might have. So a series of interactions with the same individual doesn't constitute a relationship. So again, the kind of example I would give here is that you might go into the, uh, the same shop every day and you might kind of chat with the shopkeeper and you know, buy your products, how's the weather and so on. You know, even though you're seeing this person and you're engaging in a mutually beneficial exchange, you're not having a relationship with uh, the shopkeeper. Okay? But should the shopkeeper not be there one day and it's replaced by somebody else and you engage in the same interactions but you leave feeling, oh, I've missed something, you know, I, I, there's something kind of missing from, from that interaction, then that's a sign that there, it's not, you know, there's a psychological need and maybe you are having a, a relationship, at least in your own head, with the, the shopkeeper. So here we define relationships mainly in terms of the feeling it has on you, both when you're together and when you're apart. So when you're together, it's a, a feeling of kind of well-being, and when you're apart, it's a sense of kind of distress or longing or wanting to kind of reconnect. Uh, and of course, grief would be an extreme example. So grief is normally when your partner or mother dies or, or something like this. But it could also actually be kind of unexpectedly jilted. You know, your wife's run off with the, the postman or something. That would be a grief reaction that you would uh, have in this case. And uh, yeah, so they're also known as social bonds or attachments. So an attachment would be um, a, a kind of an extreme kind of social bond where you, uh, you feel very kind of um, uh, a strong sense of well-being, a strong sense of longing when, when separated. So why do relationships matter? Well, relationships matter just in, in so far as they have uh, a, a positive effect on your kind of mood, your well-being, and so on. Uh, but also an absence of kind of intimacy or feelings of loneliness or a powerful motivator to go out and connect with others. So psychologically, relationships matter, but they probably matter psychologically because actually they matter to us in other ways as well. So for instance, being in a relationship or having kind of good social support is a strong kind of protective factor for various health disorders. So cardiovascular, immune, endocrine, and conversely, loneliness is associated with greater cognitive decline. Here, loneliness can be defined in terms of how lonely you feel rather than how many people you've met today. So maybe you've spoken to 50 people today, but you could still feel lonely if you don't feel you've got anybody to confide in or that you haven't got this kind of mutuality uh, with somebody. So loneliness and the amount of interactions are not the same thing. They're, they're kind of defined psychologically. But given that it is defined psychologically, it's kind of puzzling that it can have so many outcomes on physical health. And this is one of the things I'll talk about here. So uh, this is obviously, a lot of this field is kind of very much based around kind of the endocrine system, hormones, your, uh, so stress hormones, for instance, uh, oxytocin, which is involved in bonding and affiliation and so on. And these hormones, as well as kind of uh, having an effect on psychological states, they have effects on your body. So it's well known that stress hormones repeatedly uh, lead to these kinds of outcomes in terms of heart disease, immune function, and so on. So that's kind of the mediating reaction, really, between psychology and these kind of physical health is around uh, hormones. But also the reason why relationships matter is that really, at the end of the day, we have to, to kind of survive and our children have to survive. So relationships is about sex and it's about looking after your family. And that, that's the bottom line from an evolutionary perspective. That's why it matters. And if you're not having sex, you're not passing on your genes. Um, and this is what it's all about. Uh, but it's also about looking after your, your children once you've had sex as well. That's just as important. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. So love is obviously an important um, aspect of this. And then we'll talk about attachment, both in terms of family attachments and romantic bonds. 
we'll look at animal models and then we'll look, look about what happens when things go astray. So grief, loneliness, and being excluded, for instance. So we can think of love as being an emotion, even though it wasn't something that we thought of in terms of uh, Ekman six kind of basic emotions associated with facial expressions and so on. But actually, in many respects, it meets the criteria of a being a, a basic emotion. So it has a particular function around parental care and sexual behavior, for instance, from an evolutionary perspective. And actually, it has a well-known kind of neurobiological mechanism behind it. So we can think of emotion as uh, being the feelings that are associated with, with uh, being within an attachment relationship. Okay, that's what love is the emotion uh, of being attached to another individual or individuals. So love is kind of puzzling because we can talk about all different kinds of love. You know, the love you might have for your pet and your mother and your girlfriend are presumably very different uh, kinds of love to you. But nevertheless, we use the same word. Uh, and the idea is that although we use it in very different contexts, that there's something that pulls it together. But nevertheless, we can think of it as perhaps being multifaceted. So this is one approach from a more kind of social psychology background that, that talks about love as having three different kinds of elements. That's why he calls it his kind of triangular theory, if you will. So one is passion, which is basically a, a sexual attraction. Okay? Commitment is obviously more... Uh, a, a kind of desire, a kind of w wanting to see things through, a kind of more, um, to some extent, perhaps socially constructed that you must stay with that person. But to some extent, it's kind of a feeling, actually, I owe it to you. We, this kind of works for whatever reason. And intimacy is obviously about kind of sharing uh, uh, things, so sharing each other's thoughts and, uh, and, and so on. And, and of course, these different factors might kind of change over time or differ uh, from relationship to relationship. So here, this is one way of kind of characterizing this. So the idea is if you've got all three of these things and you have what Sternberg kind of calls consummate love, uh, that, you know, this is the full-blown kind of thing here. But you can have one without another. So, for instance, a feeling of kind of passion, but without any commitment or intimacy, is kind of an infatuation. So here, this would be kind of teenagers in love with pop stars, for instance. Uh, but the, it's kind of like a, a very intense kind of attraction, but there's nothing behind it. No sense of commitment, no sense of intimacy. It, it's completely kind of fatuous. Uh, but, of course, you could, you could commit to somebody without having any feelings of passion or intimacy. So arranged marriages might, people have a very strong sense of wanting to make it work over time, but there may be little passion or intimacy. But, of course, it might start one way and grow into that. So a lot of arranged marriages are fulfilling, uh, but they might start with one part of the triangle filled in and then fill in the other parts. Whereas maybe in Western culture, you start with passion and hope to fill in uh, the other parts as you go along. So there are different ways of kind of achieving uh, these ends uh, across cultures. <coughs> so there's evidence that, that, again, across cultures, the passionate phase is temporary. Um, most people only report having this kind of very strong, intense kind of sexual part of relationships for about six months to three years. And this is seen as being relatively culturally invariant. One reason why these numbers might kind of come out like this is this is about how long it typically would take to, uh, to conceive. Um, an average time here would be six months, and then you've got a chance of actually s uh, protecting your partner through pregnancy if you're a man, uh, and, uh, uh, and then having some kind of nurturing uh, for a year or so after. So th these... Uh, might exist kind of a, as a common basis across cultures for good reason about trying to procreate and having a kind of a minimal amount of uh, care within uh, a sexual relationship. But of course other factors might contribute to whether a relationship uh, is sustained and, and so on after the passion goes out. So again here, this is where intimacy and commitment uh, come in. So sometimes you might have a strong sense actually it's important for the family, it's important because society says it's important. There's a whole host of other reasons why uh, you stay together beyond uh, the, the passionate phase. So that's kind of a background as to how we can think about love 
the way that this has been studied from neuroscience point of views is, is very kind of simple, if not simplistic. So um, I did have a look to see whether or not uh, you, you can kind of look for this kind of uh, triangular theory in fMRI. Nobody's quite done it like that, but, but I, I can point you to some different aspects here. So Bartles and Zecchi did some fMRI studies, a very simple paradigm in which you show a photograph of a loved one against a photograph of another person. Typically, the other person is somebody who you've known for a similar amount of time, so it might be a, a friend, for instance, as opposed to, uh, in one case, you're shown an image of your, your partner, who you claim to be in consummate love with, and your mother, who, who uh, most people love in some way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what you basically find, unsurprisingly, is that when you're looking at images of loved ones, you're activating your reward circuitry. Uh, and so your nucleus accumbens, various other regions. Um, this kind of connects with the wider literature on um, hormonal effects and on these uh, hormones called oxytocin and vasopressin. Um, so these are hormones. So hormones are chemicals released into the bloodstream. They affect various organs in the body, including the brain, acting as neurotransmitters. And some regions of the brain are very rich in kind of oxytocin receptors. And these are parts of the reward-related circuitry. We'll come to that. This hasn't been um, replicated in every study. But what was initially reported by Bartels and Zecchi, which is curious, is, uh, in effect, a deactivation in some regions, such as the temporoparietal junction, medial PFC, which are involved in kind of theory of mind or mentalizing. So what a deactivation means here is that you're, in effect, activating these regions more when you see a friend than when you see a loved one. Okay? Uh, it's almost the flip round. The way that they kind of, the twist that they put on it is thinking about this in terms of love being unconditional. That when you've got a friend, you're kind of trying to judge their mindset, their motives, and other things. If it's somebody you love, you don't have to kind of necessarily go into their mind. I, I don't think, uh, I'm not sure that that's strictly true, but, but that was their way of thinking about how love differs from friendships in, in the sense that you take some things more for granted when you're, you're with a loved one that you may not with somebody uh, else who, who you have less intimacy with. <coughs> But again, kind of coming back to health issues and from a neuroscience point of view, uh, there's evidence that love acts as a buffer against both stress and pain. Uh, so here, this is simply looking at a photograph of your, uh, your partner, looking at a photograph of a stranger, or looking at a photograph of an object. Uh, or you hold the hand of your partner, you hold the hand of a stranger, or you have a squeezy ball. And at the same time, what happens is that you're given a pain, a mild electric shock, okay? What you find is, is that if you're looking at an image of your loved one or you're holding their hand, that pain is subjectively less painful. And you can look at the neural correlates of that. And again, the idea is that um, activation within your reward-related circuitry is kind of analgesic, in effect. It's kind of like a, a painkiller. So you're, at, you're still at switching on your pain circuit, but you're activating your reward circuit, and subjectively, pain is less painful. But there is a fairly well-established uh, neural mechanism for this. So this is the subjective pain rating here. So when you're holding your partner's hand or uh, looking, even just looking at your partner, pain is subjectively less than in the other two conditions. And this seems to be related, again, to activity within the reward circuits of the brain um, that, that kind of has this buffering effect. Um, there's been a whole um, series of studies looking at people within the passionate phase of uh, relationships. Um, again, looking at hormones, but also looking at various kind of clinical uh, disorders as, as well. So here, this is looking at testosterone levels in males who are in love, uh, who show a big reduction in the, the amount of testosterone. Females bizarrely go the other way. It is significant uh, here. So it's kind of an equalizing uh, effect, but, but obviously the effect's larger in males, but they have higher levels of resting testosterone as well. So it's kind of a more gentler reaction. Interestingly, this drops out after the, the passionate phase. So even though people report you know, still being in love and so on, 
this is a temporary uh, uh, change involved around the initial kind of falling in love and this kind of very uh, intense phase uh, of relationships. Here, this is looking at uh, a, mar a biomarker of serotonin. Uh, here, it, it, it's actually a, in, measured in the bloodstream. That's only because you can't get kind of this marker out of the brain with fMRI or other measures. Uh, and basically, so here they're comparing it with patients with obsessive compulsive disorder. The, the, the kind of thinking here is that when you're going through this very passionate phase, you're actually going through this kind of constant ruminations about longing and thinking about the loved one. And that this is seen as actually being beneficial. It's about kind of putting aside your inhibitions and actually letting yourself go uh, in a relationship. Uh, uh, but again, this particular thing here is just there in this passionate phase and then it bounces back. Obviously, if you have OCD, it's more of a, a kind of a constant uh, change here. I don't know the full kind of mechanism of this. I did read about it recently, but uh, it's kind of a little bit beyond what I want to cover. Um, but basically, it, it's kind of suggesting that, that love is this kind of complex thing and there are different aspects to it. Any kind of questions before I move on? The next bit. Okay. So if we think of love as a kind of being uh, an emotion, we can think of attachment more in terms of a process uh, or in terms of a kind of, I, I guess, a neurobiological learning mechanism, a very special kind of uh, neurobiological learning mechanism. And here, this is obviously one example of a, a particular kind of learning mechanism that you, you get in, um, in certain bird species where the first moving object they see, they think in inverted commas that it's their mother or at least they behave towards it as if it's their mother. So this is the, the famous kind of ethologist called Lorenz who studied this process that's called imprinting in chicks. Uh, and here you've got the, the chicks kind of following all, all around the yard, you know, as if the, the, uh, the Austrian professor is their mother. And again, there's a whole kind of series of experiments showing, you know, when they, uh, uh, what, what the conditions are for this and, and critical periods for, for this to happen. So the term attachment was initially used specifically for this kind of reaction uh, about infants becoming attached to their mothers, um, although now it's used in a much broader context, so also in terms of parents becoming attached to their infants, so it's a bidirectionality. But also this kind of process or, or the term attachment is also used again for the actual process of falling in love. And it may, may or not surprise you, the actual process of becoming attached to your infant and the, the process of falling in love is quite similar at a neurobiological level. It's employing similar kinds of hormones and similar kinds of uh, neural circuits. So the the kind of early psychological tradition of uh, attachment was to think of attachment as being a learnt response to having one's needs met. So in effect, love is a learnt reaction because you are giving me warmth, care, milk, food, whatever it may be. Okay. And this was kind of overturned in the 1950s by work on Harlow, by Harlow working on monkeys, and Bowlby, who uh, was a British psychologist working on humans who've been separated, who basically argued, actually, no, this is wrong. There is an, an innate disposition. It's not just a learnt reaction to having one's needs met. This is a, a kind of a pure kind of psychological need that, that, that arises uh, from this. So Harlow studies were based on kind of infant separation um, from the mother, and, for instance, here you would have two different mothers. One was, uh, about the artificial mothers, one would be a, a mother that's kind of made of wire and the other would be a mother that's kind of made of soft material. And, but the, uh, the mother that was made of wire would give the infant all its kind of food and milk. It would have kind of a little spout in its mouth or whatever that it would go to. But what you find is that the infant attaches to the, the mother that isn't providing the food, but provides, in this case, just something uh, nice to hold on to. So what the behaviorist uh, prediction would be is that the infant would attach to any kind of object that was providing its very basic needs. 
uh, but this is suggesting no, there are other things that, that do that. Obviously, it is providing some kind of need here in the sense of warmth, but, but either way, um, the, the behaviorist uh, idea would have predicted the opposite. And again, Bowlby was working with uh, human infants who'd been separated again from parents and suggesting actually that, you know, that this is something that's innate. It's not something that, uh, that, that is just learnt. One of the changes that's kind of happened since then as well is that uh, Bowlby was kind of arguing about the mother having a special status in attachments. And obviously it, it kind of does, but it's more of a statistical specialness rather than it being a special mechanism in the mother. Um, and what you find is that, that humans form multiple attachments uh, as they go, and uh, the mother is obviously just special by virtue of being around a lot after birth and at, at these critical periods. So most infants show attachment behavior at around seven or eight months, and again, the mother tends to dominate as an attachment figure. But at 18 months, they show attachment behavior to well, to the father equally, uh, but again, to other people who might be providing care, such as grandparents, other relatives, and so on. So the mechanism applies more broadly um, to this. So people have been looking at this from a more neuroscience uh, uh, point of view here. Uh, and again, the idea that there's this kind of virtuous cycle, so infants who are securely attached become parents who provide the right kind of uh, secure behavior for their infants. So this kind of cross-generational uh, transfer of behavior here. So if you're, if you're a healthily secure child, you become a healthy secure adult uh, and so on. What you find here is that, um, that in the parent, basically, that there's um, an increased reward response to viewing uh, a child. So here, the kind of paradigm is the one that I just described by Bartels and Zecchi, where you see an image of your infant's face, and that this, um, uh, this re results in activity reward-related uh, centers here. Um, as you become a parent, your oxytocin levels go up. So oxytocin is uh, a hormone uh, that, that's involved particularly in bonding. It's also involved in, um, in labor, in giving birth as well. So again, the act of giving birth also results in a large kind of increase in oxytocin in the, uh, in the, the mother. I'll talk about it in males uh, as well in a bit. So this also uh, results in kind of activity within the reward-related system. So it's kind of almost like a reward-related learning mechanism. If you present um, parents with kind of sounds of their infant crying, um, bizarrely, you can still get activity within the reward-related centers. So this is a, a horrible sound uh, with this. Uh, and again, this tends to vary uh, as a, a function of the quality of the attachment that you've got. So securely attached mothers uh, will activate the reward circuitry, uh, whereas insecurely ones will activate the amygdala and so on. So you've kind of got this balance between reward versus this what is an intrinsically very unpleasant sound to most people. And the idea is that this is kind of motivating as well. So here they talk about emotional regulation to, to, to cry. So when you hear a cry, uh, the idea is that um, you kind of respond to it. Uh, partly to switch it off because it's so horrible, but partly a, a, as a result of kind of more of an empathic reaction um, here. So, so this is the kind of the, the cycle. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the effects here. The, these are the ones done in fathers, where basically you, you compare here. So this is the father looking at an image of a child or his own child. You will get it for just looking at babies relative to strangers. If you show a baby's face relative to an adult stranger's face, you will activate the reward circuitry of your brain. Again, individual differences here, but by and large, it's true. Um, so this is the ventral tegment, uh, ventral tegmental, so tegmental area, is that it? Yeah, yeah. which is part of your kind of ascending dopamine system. So an early part of your kind of reward uh, circuitry here being activated by here seeing an infant's face. These are kind of involved in more negative affect, your anterior insula and anterior cingulate. This is when listening to an infant crying. 
Uh, so mother's viewing an infant face activates these kind of reward-related mechanisms, ventral tegmental area, nucleus accumbens, orbitofrontal cortex. But the same is also true in fathers and women without children uh, as well. So this might kind of be turned on more by the release of oxytocin and so on, but it is present there in others too. Now, this surprised me when I saw this slide in a paper. You really are looking at what you think it might be here. So these are the size of men's testes uh, as scanned in an MRI study. Okay, so they're not putting the, well, they're putting the brains in, but they're putting the testicles in too here. And what you're looking at here is the, the relative size of the testes, obviously relative to how big or, or tall the, the man is, and the amount of activity that you have in your reward-related circuitry to, to looking at an image of your child. And basically, the bigger the your testes, the less rewarding you find it uh, looking at, your, at an infant. The, the rewards are much greater for men with smaller testicles. Uh, and this is activity in your ventral tegma, uh, this VTA, kind of early dopaminergic uh, region. Why did they even think to look at this? Well, this was, um, it's actually motivated by work in animals uh, uh, there where there is, uh, where you tend not to do fMRI and so on, and what you can look at is the size of an animal's testicles, and you can correlate individual differences in parental behavior in, uh, in various uh, species with this. Yeah. Yes, okay, so with the, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So there must be a whole kind of series of reactions, but the basic idea is that, yes, it's testosterone. The testosterone is kind of having a modulating effect on, uh, on parental behaviour in, in males here. That, that's, that is the claim, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that this, again, would have been, well, it is looked at in, in terms of kind of injection of testosterone, other kinds of uh, behaviour here as well, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, again, very curious. <laughs> so what I could say about it. <clears throat> so this is kind of the ideal situation of secure attachments, but again, uh, people differ in terms of their level of security, which is a, f a function partly of the infant, the amount of kind of cries, but also a function of the, the mother, whether she's depressed, whether she has uh, been modeled kind of poor uh, styles of parenting from her mother and, and, and so on. And the standard way of assessing this in the lab is what's called the strange situation test. So I'll just show you a clip of this, and then I'll talk a little bit about how this works. Can the essential elements of home life be translated into a standard laboratory setting for controlled scientific study? Yeah, and the answer is yes. After conducting extensive observations of parents and children at home, a student of Bowlby's, Mary Ainsworth, devised such a procedure called the strange situation, which places the child under some stress. It has become the most widely used, standardized way to assess the quality of a child's attachment to their caregiver. Here the researchers are recording how 14-month-old Lisa responds in this attractive but unfamiliar setting. How will she react to a stranger? What will happen when her mother leaves the room? And when she returns? If Lisa's behavior when her mother returns, what psychologists call the reunion that they are particularly interested in. The most important thing is to look for the type of balance that a child strikes between an attachment to need and on the other hand to explore the head material. Once Lisa has settled down to play, a stranger enters the room and sits in a chair reading a magazine. After a couple of minutes, the stranger attempts to interact with Lisa. Soon after, Elizabeth gets a cue to leave the room. Lisa, but in vain. 
Lisbeth comes back into the room, and the camera records how Lisa reacts. Now the first part of the procedure is over, and Lisbeth settles Lisa down again. The stranger leaves them alone together. And soon after, Lisbeth goes too. Lisa is on her own. Her distress is plain to see. Once again, the efforts of the stranger to console Lisa are to no avail. But Lisbeth manages to calm her almost at once, and shortly afterwards, the observation ends. Lisa showed outward signs of what's called secure attachment. It doesn't show insecure tone. Basically, what you're doing here is that you're looking at how the child behaves when the mother leaves. So a normal reaction is for the child to show some distress, okay? That's a, that's a good sign for a child to be distressed when its mother uh, leaves. Uh, and then the, what, the thing that differs the most is how the, the child would respond um, when the mother returns. So those <coughs> who are securely attached get... Um, moderately upset when they're separated, but they respond positively. It's almost like a forgiving kind of reaction uh, when they're reunited with the mother. <clears throat> but there are other signs of insecure attachment. There's also a fourth kind, which is, is quite rare, and I, I won't go into. But these are signs of a more insecure attachment style. So an insecure attachment style, the, the, an insecure anxious attachment style, is that it becomes highly distressed, so screaming their head off, and then kind of hard to comfort when the, the mother comes in. So it's kind of beyond kind of anything, beyond the pale kind of screaming. Um, and then there's another one where insecure uh, avoidance, in which they kind of avoid contact with the mother, uh, especially at reunion here, when the mother comes back in the room. So there are various kind of factors that, that um, relate to this, but the, the attachment here is seen as being a quality of the bond between the mother and the infant, not all being the mother's responsibility or the, the infant's responsibility, but obviously there are factors with both. So the mother's kind of parenting style, but the infant's own temperament as well uh, plays a part in this uh, sort of process. And these are the various stages here that, um, that, that, that are gone through. What you find here, if you look at different kinds of, um, uh, so this is obviously looking at um, looking at brain activity in mothers uh, here. Um, that mothers who uh, are have insecure attachments show much greater responsiveness in their amygdala. So this is kind of the intensity of emotions, but is often seen as kind of being um, a kind of more negative uh, appraisal, a kind of. Um, uh, to this. And they all, in those who have the more kind of avoidance style also show greater kind of lateral prefrontal cortex activity. So we've kind of encountered this in emotional regulation before. You see something negative and you're trying to kind of have some kind of top-down control over that. Uh, you see this kind of differences within this uh, network. So again, all mothers would activate this region to a greater extent, but those who are insecure kind of seem to do so differently. Uh, and again, so as well as having uh, these parts of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, so this is your kind of reward-related center, uh, one of your kind of reward centers here, is that those who have a stronger uh, attachment security activate it more when seeing their own infant, but this correlates with the amount of oxytocin, uh, this kind of attachment-based hormone in the, the mother's blood. So again, this hormone might be acting as a mediator between the, uh, the observation of the infant and the reward-based activity in the brain. And here, this is kind of almost unbelievable research, but the first um, studies done on attachment were kind of in the 1970s. So what you have now is um, infants who were assessed for their behavior at age one, who are now adults and may or may not have children of their own. So now these people are in their 20s and 30s and you can get them back and say, do you remember doing that study as an infant? Of course they don't, but you can see what's happening in their brains as adults. Basically, adults who were previously tested as children uh, and were insecurely attached, 
they show quite a few differences in their emotional regulation of positive and negative images. Not to do with children here. So these are just looking at uh, emotional images. There, there's a, a battery called the IAPS, for instance, which has kind of some gross stuff, some you know scary stuff, or whatever. Um, uh, so, so just kind of regulating emotions is different if you were insecurely attached. And these are longitudinal studies now over 20 years or, or so. And those who were securely attached, again, show greater connectivity between some of these regions and the, the kind of reward-related uh, centers here. So you've got these different kinds of emotional regulation styles that seem to start in infancy and last uh, throughout uh, here. So it really does matter. I'll come back to this in a bit. So that's uh, in infants. What about in adults? So any questions about kind of the infancy stuff? I'll come back to this in a bit. OK. So with regards to adults, basically, um, th this kind of uh, literature that's been used to look at kind of parental uh, attachments has also been used to look at romantic partners. And basically, what you're looking at here is looking for different kind of attachment styles in, um, in relationships. So obviously, you don't measure this in adults using you know, the strange situation test or so on. What you simply do is that you give adults a questionnaire. Uh, and you can then kind of categorize people into this, uh, these sorts of categories. So um, somebody who has an insecure, anxious uh, kind of style of attachment would be in love with their partner, but would be constantly needing reassurance. Does he love me? Does she love me? You know, this kind of, uh, kind of, they need constant kind of, um, you know, attention and feedback that the relationship is okay. Very attentive to kind of, oh, he's not loving me anymore, this sort of thing. Anxious avoidance would be, yeah, I really love her, but I could also be just as happy without her. That would be a kind of an insecure kind of uh, avoidant thing that you claim to be in love, but you have a sense of, you know, it's, uh, you could take it or leave it. <laughs> this kind of uh, uh, attitude towards love would be an insecure kind of avoidant. And secure is obviously, you know, a feeling of, of need, but not of an excessive neediness. That would kind of be um, uh, something else. So one way of measuring it is kind of using these three categories that come from there. Another way is actually to think about it as a kind of a two-dimensional space um, of, of kind of security. One is how anxious you are about the relationship, and one is kind of an avoidance. So a secure person would score low on kind of relationship anxiety and low on relationship avoidance, whereas others might kind of be high in those dimensions or possibly high on both, although that's slightly contradictory to have that kind of style. So you can, instead of looking at it as categories, you can look at it as, a, as dimensions, kind of plotting yourself on this. So th there are various ways in which this has been looked at in adults. Um, but as with infancy, what you kind of find is that people who report these particular uh, attachment styles seem to have different uh, ways of interacting with other people, including with strangers. So again, this is the idea that, that um, attachment, or one way of thinking about this, which is, is kind of perhaps a little bit too Freudian for some of you, but the, the kind of attachments that you may have had with your parents are kind of used as a template for other attachments that you would have with a partner or with friends and with strangers and so on, that you have a particular style that may or may not derive from childhood that you then use as a model for other kinds of uh, relationships. Okay. But there is evidence for that, despite it being something that you may or may not feel should be the case. So what this task here is, is that you effectively um, get a bunch of participants to fill in these uh, attachment questionnaires outside of the scanner. Inside the scanner, they do the most boring experiment you, you could imagine, which is, in effect, you're, make, you're, you're seeing some visual stimuli and you're just making judgments uh, about whether they're the same or different or whatever. They're, they're a very boring task. But the interesting thing after the task is that if you get it right, you might get a, a smiley face, if, but sometimes you get this angry face. Okay? And what you find here, so this is your ventral striatum, so again, part of your kind of classic reward circuitry. 
is that those who um, report having kind of quite strong avoidant relationship styles, they respond less to the smiley face. Whereas those, so here, if you're kind of low avoidant, you're securely, you tend to have secure attachments. Okay? Whereas this would be an insecure, kind of more avoidant style. So basically, those who are securely attached have nice activity in their reward center to a smiley face telling them that they've got this right. This isn't somebody they're in a relationship with, they've never met this person before, it's just a smiley face in a boring visual task. Okay? Here, this is a different part of the brain. This is the amygdala. And here on the, the scale there is to do with anxious scores. So again, a low score here means that you're uh, securely attached, that you don't feel that you're constantly in need of finding out whether your loved one truly loves you and so on, whereas people here have this kind of reaction. So people who have this kind of relationship anxiety, when they're given this angry feedback, they show stronger activity in their amygdala, whereas those who are securely attached kind of almost take the feedback on the chin, if you will, would be one way of thinking about it. But again, again, aside from the details, I think the interesting thing about this is that the actual task in the scanner has nothing on, on the face of it to do with relationships. Uh, it's all about receiving some social feedback from a stranger. But those who have a particular relationship style uh, respond quite differently in their brains, um, you know, depending on whether you're a secure type relationship style or a more kind of insecure type. <clears throat> and again, there's a whole kind of other literature on this as well. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember whether they're all done in men, male or female, actually. It is an important question. I, I'd have to check. This particular one here is done on uh, women where you present them with... So the difference here is that you are actually presenting people with information related to relationships, whereas here this is kind of irrelevant to relationships. So if you present people with um, relationship scenarios, they read a little vignette about being jilted or breaking up with a partner, for instance. Uh, and you can show differences there between different attachment styles. So those who have the more avoidant attachment style, again, are activating their prefrontal cortex, so this kind of emotional regulation. So again, you, you see this kind of avoidant attachment style in the prefrontal cortex in your uh, regulating your cries of your infants and so on. But you also see the same kind of network responding to, to these vignettes about breaking up uh, and, and so on whereas those who have the more kind of anxious kind of relationship style uh, activate, for instance, the orbitofrontal cortex, parts of the, the emotional uh, brain involved in kind of contextualizing uh, emotions and so on. Um, again, here this is a slightly bizarre kind of uh, setup here, but they... Um, what you find is that if you present these kinds of uh, statements to people, they will produce a skin conductance response, a kind of a sweating response here, kind of emotional arousal response. But this will differ according to whether or not you have an anxious kind of attachment style or whether you have a more secure uh, attachment style. The interesting thing about this is that they present these statements fairly subliminally uh, to participants. Uh, so just very briefly and masked, and they show again here that um, the participants seem to be able to process these. And the more kind of insecure you are in your attachments, the greater the activity in your amygdala and the greater your kind of sweating response uh, to these unconscious uh, little statements. So mum rejects me or whatever, against kind of control uh, statements. <coughs> Right, so before going on to uh, the oops, sorry, don't, <laughs> before going on to the animal models, uh, what we'll do is we'll just take a break for five minutes. Um, I'd like to just get your uh, some kind of thoughts about this literature because it, it is kind of very thought provoking and raises some questions. So by all means, okay. So this is more uh, animal uh, models here, which have looked well. The, there are various animal models again. Um, with regards to kind of parent-child interactions, often people have used rats and so on, but rats actually don't form uh, stable bonds with, with a, a, a male and female. They don't kind of raise the, the, the family together and so on. So some species effectively just become sociable uh, when they have uh, kids or pups, 
whereas other species are kind of intrinsically sociable in terms of forming relationships. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I can go through this. But the, the species that tend to be used are what, what are called uh, prairie voles versus montane voles. So these are North American uh, species that are physically and genetically very similar to each other. The difference being that montane voles uh, form kind of stable uh, romantic relationships with each other, uh, whereas the montane voles do not. They're solitary. Okay? What does it mean for them to form a stable romantic relationship? It's a that basically they would stay together throughout the duration, they would raise the kids together uh, and so on. And often if one partner dies, then they don't necessarily go and find another partner and they show grieving behavior and uh, this uh, sort of thing. So, so this is kind of an interesting kind of comparison uh, between the two of them. So the question then is, what is the, uh, the difference between them? And actually what's, um, and again, this is where a lot of the literature on these hormones, oxytocin and vasopressin, come from. So oxytocin and vasopressin, yeah, there's, there's similar um, uh, hormones, uh, in effect, similar kind of chemical structures. And it's shown that the, the two animals kind of differ very much in, in the, the way that they uh, respond to them. And actually, it isn't the amount of oxytocin uh, that you have here. In this species, what they have is lots of oxytocin receptors that are distributed in certain parts of the brain. So within the, uh, for instance, the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, some of these regions we've already talked about in the lecture, that they have far more density of oxytocin receptors in the, the, the pair bonding species relative uh, to the non-pair bonding species. So it's actually about where the oxytocin goes, how it kind of interfaces with the nervous system rather than just the resting amount. Uh, of oxytocin. So that's the, the basic finding here. So oxytocin and vasopressin are hormones with uh, a similar chemical structure. They're made by the pituitary gland and uh, released into the, the bloodstream, but also uh, um, act in effect as neurotransmitters. They actually, um, you have neurons with receptors on them and the hormone actually directly stimulates uh, those, but it acts on other tissues uh, as well. Um, so in women, oxytocin is involved in kind of uh, labor and so on. So it, it's, it can be used to actually induce labor uh, in women. So it's often, when, when a lot of the experiments are done on oxytocin, it's often done in males uh, because th there are ethical issues about giving oxytocin to, to women in case they happen to be pregnant. It could induce a, a miscarriage or, or what, well, you know, not necessarily. It's a very small risk. Um, Vasopressin is a, a, a similar structure. What you find is that um, the females are, uh, a strong, are strongly sensitive to uh, oxytocin and a little bit sensitive to vasopressin. Men are actually sensitive to both, but are slightly more sensitive to vasopressin than oxytocin. So it's not the case that oxytocin is female and vasopressin is male, although there is a differential sensitivity to the two, both Males and females are sensitive to both, but it's, it's rather a degree, uh, an element of kind of magnitude in this. And both would have their own kind of receptors. So oxytocin has a particular receptor in the nervous system, and vasopressin has two or three particular receptors that are, are uh, uh, receptive to that. They also have slightly different effects on behavior as well. So vasopressin... Um, is, is associated with slightly more kind of aggressive behavior. And this is, again, seen as being kind of males kind of guarding or protecting uh, relationships, uh, in effect, is, is the, the kind of explanation of this sort of uh, link. Uh, and again, it has somewhat different effects on stress. So we'll talk about stress in a bit. But oxytocin is kind of a stress buffer, uh, reduces it, whereas vasopressin actually has the other kind of effect, kind of almost kind of maybe a more kind of motivating or protecting relationships um, kind of uh, behaviours associated with it. Uh, oh yes, that's right, and you can buy oxytocin. Um, they sell it as liquid trust uh, or liquid love, basically. And, and here you can instantly build relationships that were never possible before. It says here, when you spray liquid trust on yourself, you become instantly irresistible. 
We 100% guarantee that Liquid Trust oxytocin hormone spray will enrich your social life or your money back. No hurry, because it's a time limited. Obviously, you can buy. This. Obviously, it's, it's the mechanism behind this is not quite uh, as simple as that. Um, yeah, when you administer oxytocin, actually experimentally, you do actually have it as a nasal spray um, the, the, if, if you do oxytocin ex experiments. Um, and, and it kind of goes into the blood-brain barrier somehow through the nose. The mechanism is known. Um, if you ingest it orally, then you digest it before it gets to the brain. Is that on eBay? It is on Yes. You think I made it up? It's like, yes, you can buy it on eBay. You can buy oxytocin on eBay, yeah. Uh, but, but, yeah, I, I, I'd be interested to know what the evidence is. Well, you know, it, 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 I wouldn't go, I'd rush out to get it. I, I wouldn't trust what it says. <laughs> um, this is how, uh, so this is the, the Prairie Vols and the Montague Vols. So this is Larry Young in Emory University in the States, who's kind of the, the leading uh, researcher on this. He's written a book about love with regards to these voles and oxytocin and so on as well, which is kind of a nice pop science book. My name is Larry Young. Uh, I'm at Gertrude's National Primate Research Center. And my laboratory is really focused on understanding the neurobiology and genetics of social bonding. And we're doing this by looking at uh, small rodents called prairie voles that are unusual in that they form lifelong social partnerships between uh, the mated pair. Um, and we do comparisons between these monogamous prairie voles and related non-monogamous species, which look very similar, but they don't form any kind of bonds whatsoever. And, and what we have found is that uh, molecules such as oxytocin and vasopressin are responsible for forming that bond uh, between the partners. And the difference between the animals who can form a bond versus those who cannot are in the location of the receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin, such that the monogamous species have the receptors loaded in areas that are involved in addiction, uh, whereas the non-monogamous species uh, do not. And uh, our work has been uh, has led to some uh, very interesting discoveries uh, showing that these molecules are also active in humans, such that oxytocin uh, increases interpersonal trust and uh, polymorphisms in the vasopressin receptor predict pair bonding in human. Uh, in the laboratory, the way we study the pair bonding process in the monogamous voles is using a behavioral test called the partner preference test, uh, where we place a male and a female together and allow them to form a bond. Uh, and then we will place the partner on one side of the three-chambered arena, and we'll place a stranger on the other side of the arena, and then we'll place the experimental animal in the middle, and we'll watch and see who he goes and spends his time with. And an animal that's pair bonded will spend most of his time sitting next to and huddling his partner, huddling with his partner, and not with a stranger. And we have this whole system automated now, so we can do dozens of uh, animals at one time, and the computer uh, objectively uh, screens the data and uh, can uh, give us the results very rapidly. It's so what he's describing here is a, this kind of partner preference paradigm. So here you've got tethered females within in two compartments, uh, and then uh, it's normally a male who kind of uh, gets the choice. Um, here you've got um, the amount of uh, kind of contact. So whether or not the the the, the vole spends time with this partner or that partner, whether this is a familiar partner. The definition of familiar is that they kind of lived together for 24 hours and had sex. Uh, so that's a, a specific definition that seems to be involved in uh, in this kind of process. And so, if this, if the here you've got your prairie vole, then what you find is that the prairie vole spends a lot of time with the familiar partner and not much time with the unfamiliar partner. Uh, and again, as uh, as he was saying there, it's, it's not the case that they're just having sex. They just kind of sit together. They're just snuggling together, basically, in this compartment. If this is the Montaigne vole, you can see that actually it's asocial. So it's not the, that it's kind of 50-50. It chooses to go in this compartment and not to go uh, with either female. And it has no preference at all whether or not it's had sex with this one before or not. Okay, it makes no difference. They're both equally as good in this uh, both uh, eyes. Okay. 
So this is the, the basic um, paradigm here. So again, the oxytocin receptors are within the amygdala, nucleus accumbens, hypothalamus. This is where they're most uh, concentrated. What you find is that if you disrupt the oxytocin vasopressin system, then you kind of disrupt this partner preference system. So you can look at the causality here. Um, what you also find uh, here as well is that within the, the, the kind of nucleus accumbens, within the reward-related uh, network, you would need both dopamine and oxytocin receptors. So you can have some kind of blockade of different kinds of receptors and show in order to get the partner preference. It's not just about oxytocin. It's about both types of receptors being activated on the neurons, uh, and th this is kind of what leads to this uh, learning. The other effect that oxytocin has, and this is um, why it, one of the, so the hypothalamus is involved in uh, kind of body regulation and kind of the stress response. So the HPA is your uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. So this is involved in releasing the stress hormone cortisol. And basically what you find is that when oxytocin is released, it will bind to receptors within the hypothalamus and switch off the, the stress-releasing uh, cortisol uh, response. Is it. So again, this is pointing to how uh, love and attachment kind of then might have effects on the body, on the immune system, on the, the functioning of the heart. It's via the kind of regulation of this uh, neurobiological stress system. Um, in maternal attachment, oxytocin is also involved. So th this is kind of attachment with, uh, with adult uh, voles. You can look at it in other uh, species as well. Um, so in mothers, oxytocin is, is linked to kind of both giving birth and, uh, to, produce, and to lactating as well. Uh, but if you block oxytocin in a certain period, it, it disrupts the attachment formation. Okay, uh, so the the, the mother d doesn't look doesn't engage in kind of grooming or caring behaviours uh, if you block uh, oxytocin. But if you most uh, most female rats would uh, would kind of attack a, a baby rat if it came across one. It doesn't like them. If you inject the, the rat with oxytocin, it would go and care for it, even if it isn't its own rat. So what happens when a female rat becomes pregnant is that the pregnancy-related hormones actually switch on the genes for the oxytocin receptor, and it effectively floods the brain with creating oxytocin receptors in, in the, the female rat. Uh, in humans and other species who are naturally social, we would already have all our oxytocin receptors in place, and it's not clear that being pregnant actually increases the, the, the turnover of oxytocin receptors. There's no evidence either way for that. Um, so it's a somewhat different mechanism in other species, is that it might be triggered by uh, pregnancy itself in some species, whereas in other species they're just in place uh, from birth, and this facilitates kind of uh, forming romantic attachments and means that you know, humans like babies kind of intrinsically, even if they haven't got their own uh, ones, even if they've never been pregnant or whatever. Um, Okay, so this is the this is just kind of my schematic, but basically the hypothalamus kind of produces um, oxytocin. It has an effect on a whole host of regions. So the nucleus accumbens is involved in uh, attachment and kind of learning, uh, uh, forming this kind of process of reward uh, and and love in effect. Um, but also has a negative effect on the stress system. So via the the HPA cortisol being a kind of a biomarker uh, of stress. And this seems to be mediated by the amygdala. So the amygdala is kind of your, your fight or flight response. It kind of switches the amygdala off, uh, in effect, or dampens the, the responsiveness of the amygdala to, uh, to threats. So we'll come back to evidence for this in a bit. But also it has other uh, effects as well. So the pituitary release of the blood, and this has effects, for instance, on in the breast for, for producing milk and uh, this sort of thing. What about in humans? So there are various ways in looking at it in humans. So one way of doing it is to actually administer oxytocin. So here you do you have it as a kind of a nasal spray and you compare it against a placebo condition. If you administer oxytocin, then what you find is that 
it, it, when you see a fearful face, for instance, you have less of a response in your amygdala to that. Uh, so again, it has this kind of dampening effect on, uh, on fear or kind of negative emotions. It's kind of almost a positive bias that, that, that it creates. So these are kind of the economic type games we talked about last week. So the trust game is where you kind of invest money in a partner and then the partner returns them in the investment or could steal it uh, or whatever. And, and what you find here is that if you administer oxytocin, then you're more likely to kind of invest, you're more likely to kind of trust money to the other player that they're going to send a good return back and they're not just going to take it for themselves. Testosterone actually has the opposite effect. It makes you less trusting in this kind of game. Uh, we talk about that in another lecture. <clears throat> and here this is kind of um, looking at a stress test. So this is something called the Trier stress test. Well, basically what you have to do is that you have to uh, prepare giving a speech to a, a particular panel. Uh, so they give you a topic to talk about, you know, your attitude to the death penalty or something, and you have to prepare, you give them five minutes to prepare this uh, particular speech. And what, what's done here is it's a two-by-two two design where some participants are give, uh, given oxytocin, some are given a placebo, and some have a friend with them whilst they're delivering the speech, and some don't. So you've got social support and you've got oxytocin. What you've got here as your measure is the amount of cortisol. So this is the amount of uh, a stress-related hormone in the blood as a result of giving this uh, public speech, either after having oxytocin, either with or without having a friend with you. So the, the biggest kind of cortisol uh, response is this condition here, in which you have no social support and the placebo condition. The best condition is the blue response here, where you've got the lowest cortisol response, and this is the condition in which you've got both social support and oxytocin. So you've got your friend there when you're giving the speech, and you've be, been given oxytocin. And this is kind of an interactive effect. So it's not just that the drug itself has the difference. It depends on the context as well. So you've got the context as well as the, uh, the, the drug here. Both matter. So it's not just that the drug is the all-powerful thing. It depends on uh, the, the social setting here. Both factors have uh, come into play. Okay. And, and here, I think that this is just whilst you're uh, preparing for the, the speech, or it's the critical kind of time window for the test, and then it takes a while for your, your stress to kind of peak uh, after doing that. Yep. Um, yeah, I wonder if it's significant. So the purple one is the social support with the placebo. The support, By itself, yeah. So what they what they um, say here, so yeah, I hadn't noticed that before, but the way that they describe it is in terms of an interaction. So th what they're saying is that oxytocin has a much bigger effect with kind of social support. So yes, you're right. You can even conclude that oxytocin by itself is, is not having much of an uh, uh, effect over and above having social support. But of course you could say that social support is kind of an oxytocin release anyway, so you're not, uh, you know, it's, um, you could say that they're kind of matched at that level anyway. But yes, I, I don't know whether these, whether the green and the purple are different from each other, but I know that they report it as an interaction between the two factors. So as well as administering this, what you find in humans is that, that, we, that we have one oxytocin receptor, but it exists in different genetic polymorphisms. So um, we have two copies of the oxytocin receptor gene, one from our mother and one from our father. It's the same for all of our genes. We've always got two copies of everything. But there are certain mutations in this gene uh, in which one particular amino acid is changed. So you either have an A amino acid or a G amino acid. And because you've got two copies, it means that you can either be an AA, a GG, or an AG, depending on, on what you've got. And again, although the, these are kind of mutations, they're so common in the population that basically within this room, half of the people would have a mixed uh, uh, one and, uh, and a quarter would kind of be heterozygous in, in having both types. So, um, and what you find here is that um, differences in the oxytocin receptor have a broad range uh, of effects on cognition. 
Um, and basically what you find is that the GG carriers um, are more socially sensitive. Um, what this, uh, and th this means various things. So this is empathic accuracy. Uh, th this is Simon Baron Cohen's kind of reading uh, the, the mind and the eyes. So looking at somebody's face and deciding whether they're confident or amused, this sort of thing. So it actually has an objective score to it. You can mark them as correct or incorrect. This one here is a more subjective measure. You just give people a questionnaire as to how empathic they are. Uh, and you find that the GG carriers are more empathic. So here on the left, you've got males, and on the right, you've got females there. So it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. If you have the GG allele, you're more uh, uh, empathic, both on this kind of more mentalizing measure and on this more kind of questionnaire-based measure. Um, what else uh, can we say about it? Yeah. The GG uh, the type, although you seem to be better at uh, the, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's the, okay. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. There is. It's, it's done in a Chinese sample. And what you find is that autistic people are more likely to have the A allele than the G allele. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I think it's unlikely that this means that oxytocin is a cause of autism. It's just a kind of contributing factor. And the, what I would kind of expect is that it probably means that you're kind of more likely to go below the threshold for diagnosis or above it. So, you know, it's kind of just a shifting factor. I don't think that autism is caused by oxytocin, but it's probably exacerbating or mediating uh, other symptoms. But, but it is there, yeah. <clears throat> um, so you're also kind of more likely to respond to uh, startle as well. If you have the GG uh, type, Although you seem to be better socially, you're actually more sensitive to something bad happening to you. So if you're a GG character, uh, GG carrier, sorry, and you experience neglect as a child, you have a much worse outcome than the AA type. So although the AA type look as if they're kind of not as good socially, it actually conveys some resilience to bad things happening to you, uh, in, in effect. Um, and also, you might kind of imagine that if you're socially sensitive, you'd be very secure. It goes the other way around. If you're socially sensitive, you're more likely to have an insecure attachment type. Okay? So the GG carriers are, um, have more anxious attachment types. And this is adult attachment style. So these are questionnaires about you know, whether or not you know, your partner really loves you or this sort of thing. You're, you're more likely to feel like that if you're a GG character, carrier. Uh, and yes, yeah, so people have also looked at these polymorphisms with regard to parental behavior and you know, how you look after infants and uh, this sort of thing as well. So, so again, the, the effects are there, but I, I would think of them, as, as I said, with, with regards to autism as kind of a modulating influence rather than being, you know, this is the mechanism that, that's in place. I, I think it's just one of many uh, things that, that are out there. With, um, so these are kind of, ex well, the first one's an experimental administration of oxytocin. What about if you just look at the amount of oxytocin uh, in your blood? Well, you can increase the amount of oxytocin in your blood by having sex or masturbating, basically, at the, the bottom line. So, so that's one way of kind of doing that. But again, the, 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 the idea here is that this is kind of helping you to, to bond with the person you're having sex with. There, there is a reason why, why it works like this, okay? And that's true both for men and women. Um, this is kind of a more puzzling result that, that actually people who are more dissatisfied with their relationships seem to have more oxytocin in it. And that's kind of the opposite of what you might expect. Uh, and people haven't quite got to the bottom of what's going on with this. What it might be is that, that this is kind of almost um, like a motivating factor that's encouraging you to reconnect with your partner and kind of re-fall in love with them. It's kind of almost like a compensatory uh, overactivity of the system. What it suggests is that you can't just take the amount of oxytocin as kind of a proxy of, you know, how much in love you are. Because it might be that, you know, when things are struggling, that actually you boost the system. Another possibility here is that what's happening in your blood might not be what's happening in your brain. So it might be that actually um, 
you've got more oxytocin in your blood because you've got less in your brain. <laughs> would be, you know, a very simple-minded way of looking at it. But some people have suggested that here that you, you know you you can't actually in humans look at the amount of oxytocin in the in the brain. You can in other uh, species, or, or you can kind of have other markers of it. Yeah, that's right. So. Exactly. So rather than being this it's some kind of complex U-shaped curve that, uh, you know, at one point it kind of almost becomes toxic or, you know, or whatever. Yeah, but it, whatever the relationship is, it's not as simple as, you know, the makers of liquid trust would kind of necessarily have you believe. Yeah. Um, so the last part, what I want to talk about is when things go wrong. So this is about uh, falling in love. What about being excluded or not having social intimacy? So there are various ways in which this has kind of been explored. And this, this is kind of an interesting, um, kind of very simple game that, that has had some uh, interesting results. It's, it's called a cyberball game. And basically, you have three players, you and two other people. And all you do is that you just sit there, and you've got two buttons to press. And basically, at some point, a player throws you a ball, and you then decide which of the two players to throw to. That's all the task is. You just decide, yeah, I'm going to throw to this player, I'm going to throw to that player. Uh, so in one condition, you kind of have this game with the other two players. In another condition, you throw the player to this chap, and then they just carry on throwing the ball to each other, and they don't throw it to you. Okay, so this is, again, it's a very dumb kind of simple example, but people get quite upset <laughs> about it. Uh, and obviously they're told that the players are there, they're online or something like that, so there are real humans behind it, and that does kind of matter. What, the reason why this is kind of interesting is that this is, um, it correlates with various brain regions involved in kind of the emotional brain. But this particular region in the mid-singulate is seen to be involved in pain. So the idea here is that being, when you excluded, so this condition relative to that one is in some sense painful. Okay? And, and the kind of wider claim here is that the evolutionary, um, that this kind of social mechanism has piggybacked onto uh, a more ancient mechanism to do with physical pain, and that social pain and exclusion uh, and loneliness is kind of painful, at least in some metaphorical, not well, partly in a metaphorical sense, but partly here in the sense of having a shared neural circuits with physical pain. There's other evidence for this as well. So those who are sensitive to physical pain, so this the thermal grid's just a, like a pain illusion. You've got kind of hot and cold bars. You put your hand on it, and at some point it's like really ouch, and you can kind of vary the threshold uh, here with which you feel that. Those people who are more sensitive to physical pain report a bit more kind of sensitivity here when they're ostracized, when the, the ball isn't thrown to them. So again, it suggests that there's this relationship also, there's a whole literature around kind of uh, distress and so on in, uh, in animal models. Uh, so, so opioids are kind of analgesics. Um, you know, if you break your leg, you'll be given you know, morphine or you know, something equivalent to heroin uh, to do that. Um, but also, th these drugs are, uh, and the kind of neurobiology of the opioid system seems to be involved in kind of social distress when you separate, for instance, um, an infant rat from its mother and so on. The, these particular uh, systems um, uh, seem to be uh, involved. But also, you can look not only for differences within, uh, genetic differences within the oxytocin system, you can look at genetic differences within the opioid system. So your brain has natural opioids as well, and obviously when you get a drug like heroin or whatever, it's kind of tapping those mechanisms. But again, your sensitivity to those drugs varies. Some people have a more sensitive version of the uh, opioid receptor, and some have a less sensitive. So those who have a more sensitive uh, version of the opioid receptor are also more susceptible uh, on self-report when they get excluded in this kind of paradigm. So what this suggests is that, that basically individual differences in um, the, the, the pain system seem to relate to individual differences here in, in this particular social setting and, and in terms of this particular neural uh, architecture. And again, this can perhaps be exacerbated in grief. Um, 
So grief is, so here, this is just kind of an arbitrary situation where you're excluded by strangers. So grief is when um, an attachment relationship is kind of permanently severed. So normally with death, but it could be that your partner has run off uh, at something like this. That would be kind of a grieving reaction. So um, it's Queen Victoria there. So this is a study uh, here looking at people grieving. So th this is uh, women who'd lost either a mother or a sister to cancer. And they're shown, uh, act, they're shown images of the, uh, the loved one in, in an fMRI uh, scanner. Pun? Ethical? Uh, well, they, they, they don't kill the, the mother or the sister. <laughs> they, they do, they've just died of natural causes. Uh, but, uh, but yes, uh, they, they're grieving women who've agreed to have their brain scanned, basically, yes. I mean, presumably it's not just you know, a day or two after the death. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so they're showing photographs of their, their loved one uh, whilst their brains are being scanned. So in the, the standard reaction, if you see an image of your loved one, you will activate your reward circuitry. If you see an image of your loved one, your loved one is dead, you activate your pain circuitry. And so you've got a, a, a switch between uh, the same kind of physical stimulus and your emotional respond to it either as being rewarding or as being painful, in effect. What they look at is also individual differences in grieving. So some people have what's called complicated grief, and that is the kind of classic Queen Victoria syndrome, where you become obsessed with thoughts of the, the dead person. So in the same way as when you fall in love, you become obsessed with thoughts of the loved one. You can have this reaction when, uh, when you're grieving. Uh, so obviously it's normal to kind of, you know, go through this kind of obsessive kind of thinking about somebody who's uh, dead, but to some extent this can be complicating or stops you leading a normal life, in inverted commas. And what you find is that those who have the, this kind of complicated grief syndrome are, are in effect kind of in this transition state of activating both of these kind of pain-related areas. So this is your uh, anterior cingulate cortex. This is the per periaqueductal gray, part of the brain stem that, that's very rich in opioids. Uh, is that these women um, in this study activated both the pain matrix and the, uh, the reward-related regions, those who have complicated grief. So it's almost as if they're in this kind of transition uh, state here. So loneliness is obviously similar to, to social exclusion in this kind of cyberball game here, but it's not quite the same as uh, exclusion. So if you're lonely, you're not necessarily being rejected by others. So for instance, it could be related to shyness rather than actual kind of overt uh, rejection. But it is related to at least the perception of being isolated or kind of a lack of intimacy and not necessarily actual isolation. So again, you can do measures that, that pull these apart. We say, you know, how much contact have you had with people versus how much intimacy do you feel with people? And you can have two people who, uh, at least on one measure, have equated the amount of kind of social contact, but one person feels very lonely and somebody who, um, who feels kind of socially supported and others don't. So it's about the perceived quality of those interactions that you're having. Uh, with people. Um, but again, here, this is uh, just a kind of a model of loneliness where, where basically you, you kind of almost have a vicious cycle here that, um, that it, if you perceive yourself being isolated, then you kind of pull yourself away from social interactions. But also you become hypervigilant for social threats. You become more anxious towards rejection or you're looking for rejection cues in other people uh, in, in effect if you're, if you're feeling lonely. So you've got this kind of altered attentional bias and so on and then you look for kind of confirmatory evidence that actually yes I am being rejected by others uh, and so on and then you withdraw more. So you've kind of got this uh, negative reaction. And in the middle what you also have is uh, an increase in the stress response. So your cortisol levels go up. Um, uh, increase in the HPA, so this is your hypothalamic pituitary axis. So uh, again, the neural markers of stress, the biomarkers such as the stress hormone, and then behavioral markers such as diminished sleep quality. So you kind of end up in the cycles. But the idea is that these kinds of effects themselves also have negative effects on health, both mental health, but actually also physical health. And it's about these kinds of, uh, 
reactions kind of uh, having an effect both on your heart and your immune system, cognitive decline and so on. So, so that's uh, the basic idea here. So this is kind of a study by Cacioppo et al. an fMRI study looking at lonely people and non-lonely people where they're shown uh, pleasant uh, images that are of a social nature, such as, you know, people at a party, versus pleasant images of a non-social nature, so, um, you know, whatever that might be, um, and looking at activity in their brains. Uh, and here this is looking at activity in, again, the the ventral striatum, nucleus accumbens, part of your reward circuitry here. And what you find in the, those who are um, lower in lonely is that they activate their reward circuitry a lot more for social uh, scenes, whereas lonely people activate their reward circuitry a lot more for non-social scenes. Um, so again, this is probably not something that, that is static over time. You know, if a lonely person stops becoming lonely, I'm sure that the brain response will change, although this was not a longitudinal study. It was looking just at people at a particular point in time. But again, it's, it's partly probably around whether or not you find social situations kind of fear-inducing because you feel that everyone's kind of ignoring you, you find it stressful because you're shy or, or, or whatever. Um, Okay, so you have this response in your kind of uh, reward-related regions, but also uh, you've also got responses in, this is kind of one of the parts of the brain involved in theory of mind, your kind of temporoparietal junction. Um, yeah, so uh, again, the, the um, lonely people kind of activate this a lot more relative to, to lonely people in, in certain social situations. It's almost like they're kind of really uber thinking about what other people are thinking would be um, one way of uh, interpreting this you know, as a kind of reverse in inference. So just to kind of wind up and just to get you to kind of volunteer any thoughts about this particular literature and the particular paper I sent around. So we've talked about um, a mechanism that links together social pain and kind of separation with physical pain. Here's something that links um, social warmth and social intimacy with physical warmth. So here's a claim, in effect, that those people who are lonely are kind of um, self-medicates by making themselves more physically warmer. And the idea here is that those people who are, lack social intimacy are, in some sense, kind of feeling the cold more than those who are uh, more socially well-connected. And the evidence that they kind of put forward to is very intriguing. It involves how much time you spend in hot baths and hot showers and what temperature you have them set to. Okay, so is this, what do you make of this kind of evidence? If you haven't read the paper, then, then try and think about the, the kind of issues around separation and grief and attachment that we've covered so far.